what is the frequency response of an RLC circuit. And here we have a circuit with a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor. And we're showing an input voltage here with X and an output voltage with Y. And this, for example, might be an audio signal where this is from the microphone. And then you might connect an amplifier across these terminals uh, for the amplification to a speaker. And we'd like to know about the frequency response of the circuit. How does it affect that signal when it goes into the amplifier? Well, we can write an equation around this circuit of voltage drops where X voltage here equals the drop around the circuit. So the voltage drop across a resistor is the current times the resistance and the current is the same current as through the capacitor. So this is an equation for the current through a capacitor, C times the derivative of the voltage across the capacitor. So this is the voltage across the resistor plus the voltage drop across an inductor is L times the derivative of the current. This was the current, so this is the derivative of the current here, uh, where we've got the second derivative, plus the voltage drop across the capacitor, which equals Y. And we can take Laplace transforms of each of these terms, and that gives us this expression here. The Laplace transform of the input is just simply X. The Laplace transform of the output Y is just capital Y as a function of the Laplace variable S. And of course, the Laplace transform of derivatives as S times the Laplace transform of the function and second derivative gives F squared. So here we have this equation. You can collect all of the YS terms together. And if you divide through by XS, you'll get YS on XS, which will give you the system response. So that's what I've done here. And we've got an equation for the system response. We can see here that there's S squared terms on the bottom and an S term. And uh, this is going to give us a quadratic on the bottom. So we can find the poles by finding the values of S where this equation on the denominator equals zero with the usual quadratic formula. So here we've got minus B, that's this term here, plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all divided by 2A in the standard form for the quadratic formula. And now we can see for this circuit here, there's going to be two different scenarios, depending on what is happening inside the square root here. So if the term inside the square root is negative, then you'll be having complex poles. But if the term inside the square root is positive, you'll have real poles. So let's consider those two scenarios. So here we're going to consider the scenario first where the term inside the square root is positive. That's what this means here. And as we've said, that means there's going to be two real valued negative poles. Uh, so you can confirm that because the thing inside the here when you take the square root is going to be less than the R on L here. So the poles are definitely going to be negative. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the Laplace transform here, plot it here, and then we're going to from that visualize and see what the frequency response is. We'll plot that over here, function of frequency. We'll also of course find the impulse response because it's the inverse Fourier transform. So let's consider this here. Let's think about what's happening here. Let's see with two negative real poles. Well, what I plotted here is the S plane uh, on the base. And then we're going to plot the magnitude of the Laplace transform on the vertical. That's this function here. So where are those poles? They're real valued. So omega equals zero. So they're along this sigma axis here. And so I'm just going to draw two X's here which are the two negative real poles. It depends, of course, on the values of R, L, and C. Now let's think about this function. It's a quadratic on the bottom where the poles are. The value of the function is infinity. So I'm going to draw some dotted lines going up from here. This means that the function is infinite at that time, uh, at those values of S. And then if we look when S is very large, so out at the extremes of omega and sigma, then this relationship here, uh, the denominator gets very large, so the value of h of s goes to zero. So we're going to be having a function that looks like this, is coming down, if I'm just plotting along the sigma axis here, then it's going to be coming down here and going back up here, and then coming down and going along here on the sigma axis. If I plot it on the omega axis, then it's also going to be coming down the function uh, along the omega axis from these two uh, poles here. And if you can visualize that three dimensional plot, 
that you're seeing here when I'm uh, plot, trying to plot in three dimensions. Okay, so we've got these like two peaks uh, from let's say volcanoes, so the shapes of volcanoes, and they're coming down uh, from, the, uh, from those two poles. So now we're gonna try and understand the frequency response. Well, that is when sigma equals zero. So that's along this omega axis. So I'm now going to, if we think about what's happening along the axis where this pole is, for example, so if I just drew a dotted line parallel to the omega axis, then the function h of s goes up along here, this picture very up to infinity, and then comes down and goes back to zero along that line there. So along the omega line, I'll just draw that in here in green, I think you can see, hopefully you can visualize your mind's eye that it's going to be starting low, coming up to there, that's where it's gonna hit its maximum, and then it's gonna go back to zero. So if I draw some vertical lines in here, we're seeing that slice through the Laplace transform function along the omega axis, and that's the shape that you're gonna get. So that is giving us the Fourier transform, because when the value of S, I'll just write here, remind us that S equals sigma plus J omega, J is the complex uh, variable, then when sigma equals zero, you've got S equals J omega, and that gives us the Fourier transform in from this expression here. So it's that green shape. So I'm gonna plot it here, just with respect to omega here, it's gonna be a shape that looks like this. And we can see that for this shape, under this condition, when you pick the resistor, the inductor, and the capacitor values such that this expression is positive, then you're going to get a low pass filter. So the frequency response is going to have the effect from this circuit of enacting a low pass filter. The high frequency components will be suppressed and the low frequency components will be propagated through. Uh, so this is uh, an important way to visualize the relationship between the Laplace transform and the Fourier transform. In this case, the inverse uh, transform of this gives us a function which is zero for negative time, and then comes up and comes down as a negative exponential. Uh, that's the impulse response. Let's consider the other case when the term under the brackets here is negative. And in this case here, we're going to have, still to have two poles, but they're going to be complex poles uh, with a negative real part. So two complex poles here. Uh, and uh, negative real part. So I'm gonna draw them in here, and let's say, for example, they're gonna be symmetric around the sigma axis because it's plus or minus the same value. So I'm going to draw one of those poles uh, at, at this value here, uh, trying to draw in three dimensions, but drawing it in the plane, and the other pole, the same distance, but in the other direction, I'm gonna draw that here. So again, the poles mean that the value of the Laplace transform goes to infinity, so I'm gonna draw these dotted lines above uh, the poles here. And then of course, we can see that now along that axis between the poles, they'll be at infinity coming down and going back to infinity. And along that axis, they'll be going to zero. If I continue that line there parallel to the omega axis, this will come down here and go out to zero out there. And then, Coming along in the sigma direction, we're going to have these uh, hills coming down like this. Let's think of it exactly the same way, two different volcanoes, and they'll be coming uh, down uh, like this, if I can try and draw that in three dimensions. Hopefully you're seeing that picture in three dimensions. There's a dip between the middle, that dip will be coming down uh, here uh, and going like this, but at a lower height than these two that are coming down from infinity. So again, if we want to find the frequency response, we can look along the omega axis when sigma equals zero. And if I try to draw that in the green pen again, then this is crossing over the omega axis. Here is gonna be coming down. We go up the hill, down the hill, up the hill, and down the hill. And I'll try and draw some vertical lines here to show that we're, that green slice is above the omega axis. So in the frequency domain, now we have a function that looks like this. And this function here is now more like a band pass filter, not a low pass filter, because the low frequencies are getting suppressed, the high frequencies are getting suppressed, but some frequencies in this middle band here are being propagated through. So depending on the values of R, L, and C, 
this circuit can give you either a low pass filter or a band pass filter. And the impulse response of this band pass filter is a function that looks like a sinusoid that's multiplied by a negative exponential and it looks like this. So this is the impulse response of this circuit when you choose those resistor, inductor and capacitor values in such a way that you get these complex poles. So here, uh, in this case, uh, you're getting a, an impulse response that goes, responds and then dies down uh, in, in a uniform monotonic way. But in the case for the uh, bandpass filter, it's going to oscillate. That's the effect of having complex poles. In the time domain, the impulse response oscillates and you have a bandpass filter. Hopefully this has given you more insights into RLC circuits and also the relationship between Laplace transform and the Fourier transform. If it has, um, like the video, it will really help and help others to find the video. Of course, you can subscribe to the channel for more videos and check out the description below. You'll find a web page which has a full categorized listing of all the videos on the channel.